All right, now returning to Tennis Channel Inside In. We've done a few podcasts. It's been about a year uh, not driving a car this time, which is good. Pam Shriver, uh, you know, fellow Los Angeles Brentwood neighbor of mine, too. So, Pam, welcome to the show. I know you're a big podcast personality in the tennis streets. Thanks for coming on a little me- my show. <laughs> Thanks for having me again. There's always, no matter the month, the week, there's always so much to talk about in tennis. I had a lot of notes written down, and then you were coming on. I'm like, okay, I have even more to talk about. Like, we're in the Asian swing, and I know this time of year, everyone is, you know, debating whether or not the season goes too long and the schedules. But you see the high level of tennis in a region of the world that hasn't had it in a while, and you see what these players are playing for. I mean, you can go to both tours. The top players and some of the mid-level players are still out there fighting either to get the ranking points at the end of this year, Pam, or in some of the very best players. We saw Ego, we saw Sinner win titles. They're setting themselves up to be major players in the following years to come. Yeah, it's a time of the circuit that's really interesting to follow. A lot of times it can be who's managed themselves best during the year. Um, it's interesting because, you know, having joined the Donna Vekic team about a year ago, exactly this week, during the uh, San Diego 500 that was in mid-October in 2022, I have more of a firsthand feel to what each segment of the tour is like and how it can wear on a on a player, um, because when you're when you commentate and then you, you you know you're living your life with your family and your kids, yeah, you kind of forget what you went through as a player all those years ago. But it is it's a tough long season, but all the more benefit to the players who can figure out how to stay motivated and stay healthy and really manage the process. Yeah, and Donna is a great example. Right around the time you took over, it was kind of her end of the year was great, made that San Diego final, set herself up for a good 2023. And that's just a funny story because I saw you down there at San Diego and it wasn't official yet, but it was like after the fact connecting the dots. I'm like, oh, there, there's Pam, Donna's playing. You're with your boys, I believe. And then the news breaks. I'm like, oh, that, that actually makes sense. Well, it was <laughs> just a total... Um Venture on my part, I wasn't working for Tennis Channel. My kids were mostly in school. I was with my oldest, who was not in school. Um, And we just drove two hours down to take a look at a tournament where I wasn't working. I just wanted to kind of be a fan of women's tennis, connect with a few players like Pagula and Vekic on the player council. Next thing you know, start talking tennis with Donna, and she was pretty receptive. And, you know, it's it's like what we saw with Brad Gilbert is it's, it's really – easy to be a positive influence with a a new voice early on and then it's kind of been the last few months is okay because it's part-time for me I can't Mm -hmm. travel all the time it's like how can I influence now that it's been a year because Donna's kind of been hanging around the 20 to 24 in the rankings Mm -hmm. and you know has she hit her ceiling or can she really gear up for 2024 and make a push back towards the top 10 have you enjoyed that process and, and learned some things about not just her game and her style, but the coaching process, being on the other side of it, knowing that you've been involved in the game for so long? But this is a different role for you. Yeah, it's first time. I mean, it's really crazy. I'm 61. I've been playing the sport since I was four or five years old. It's been my primary A career as a player and then B career as a broadcaster. And then to throw in that I could have a new experience yeah. um, at, at this late in the game just shows you how wonderful the sport is. And I, I have enjoyed it. I mean, I coached a little bit at like my kids at middle school, and I've done a little bit of casual coaching on my home court, but nothing like this. But also the neat thing is to understand what it means in this day and age to be a part of a team. Right. So Donna has a couple of great European-based um, people on her team. Nick Horvat, who's Croatian, is her primary coach. And Yannick is in charge of the um, off-court fitness and also the physical therapy. He kind of combines both roles. In Europe, they do that a lot where it's not like you need one person to help you with your training and Mm -hmm. another person to help you keep yourself healthy. Um, And then we're looking to add, actually, next year is a really good, consistent hitting partner because I can't hit anymore. I mean, I can (laughs) feed some balls. And then Nick is a little bit, you know, older as far as it goes to be able to hit uh, in the kind of way that Donna needs. So we're always trying to yeah. help and figure out how to add to the team. Well, hopefully you get, hopefully you get some nice candles out of it at least. <laughs> I mean, I've bought a yeah. couple. I okay. bought a couple for my kids yeah. and um, went to the little Wimbledon reception where I saw Tiafo walking by and I <laughs> roped Francis in to come in and support Donna's candle effort. And That's like a DMV thing. Like yeah, he has exactly. to say yes. He's just Actually, bound by and, that. And interesting, on December 1st, Francis is going to be the first active player to be inducted into the USTA Mid-Atlantic section along oh. with my great friend Sarah Fornashari, 
who's a big fan of the tennis awesome. channel, and um, I'm going to go back and be the MC. So I've been texting nice. with Francis, say, "Hey, you got to show up in person, <laughs> yeah. get this award." That's awesome. No, that's just great to see and great to hear. You know, looking at this women's tour now, I wanted to start with the player that was number one, Iga Fiontek, wins Beijing, does it remarkably. You know, loses one set to Garcia in that tough match, but goes through Coco, goes through Samsonova in the final. You know, it's a ho-hum year, right? Everyone's like, oh, it's a letdown year. She just won her 60th match. So it'd be nice to have a letdown year like that. You just had a sense, right, that she would adjust. And that's why I, there's no direct comparison sports-wise to tennis, but it is almost like a combat sport, one-on-one. There's adjustments. She was being chased. You knew that she would find a way to retool her game. I think this is the least shocking bounce back I can think of. Well, and you think about the great players through the years, um, the ones that have been at the top who maybe lose a spot or two in the rankings, they tend to respond pretty yeah. well. Um, you know, you think about how Serena responded to, say, having losses, um, the revenge tour that she might have been on at certain points of her career. And I think Iga took that when she faced Coco. I mean, obviously Coco had the wrong side of that set after set after set, was able to come out on top in uh, Cincinnati, and then Iga, you know she would have gone into that next match after the loss, totally motivated to figure some things out. And I, I, what I see from Iga since she lost the number one ranking is certainly she described a little more freedom to, to try and figure out some new wrinkles in her game, whether it's coming to net more, yeah. uh, using her second serve with a little more authority. So it's kind of fun to see the best try and get even better. The pressure is, it's going to be their relative, but not being hunted every week. We're seeing it with Sabalenka. You're number one in the world, and that might not, I mean, Iga could get it back at the finals, but it's a different level of pressure. It's a huge honor, but everyone chasing you. I mean, I don't know that anyone who hasn't felt it could even relate. Yeah, I mean, I only felt it <laughs> being at the top of the doubles, which is yeah. a totally different feeling. But um, having lived alongside Martina for all those years, really close to Chris Everett, mm -hmm. Um, and some other number one players. Um, it really is interesting to see the best, and we've seen it on the men's side for the last 20 years, how well the big three was able to just, you know, attempt to keep their position at number one, or if they lost it. Mm -hmm. They're they, like unicorns, though. Like, you can't even compare them to normal <laughs> like people. Well, what's interesting about 2023 is I think it'll yeah. go down as the first year that we get an indication what the sport's going to be like after mm -hmm. the big three, and I'll say it's looking pretty good as we sit yeah. here talking in mid-October. Oh, yeah. And, and for Iga, just getting back to her for a second, Beijing, that tournament, she said directly that I went for less. I played a little cleaner. And that is, you know, look, her A game is exceptional, but I did think a fair criticism of her was she didn't really adjust because she didn't have to a lot of times. If she's able to kind of make these self-aware, you know, recalibrations, I mean, then watch out for everyone else, Australia and beyond. Well, just look at the quality of an athlete we're talking about. Yeah. Her skills are incredible. She loves to learn. Um, seems like she has an open mindset. Um, so <laughs> I think it, it goes together. And, uh, you know, while I'm sure she wanted to hang on to the number one ranking, mm -hmm. Um, I think she kind of yeah. wore the pressure of the number one. We mm -hmm. can sort of see it gnawing away at her. So I think it is good for her to have a little break and then chase it down again. And on clay, it's her era. So it's her run of the mill on clay. That's never been anything, even this year winning it. I, I did want to ask you, though, this is kind of the closest I'll get to like a hot button, hot take question, although I have to warn guests because it's show king and has gotten aggregated. But, you know, you mentioned her, your good friend, Chrissy Everett. Do you think Iga can get to seven RG titles? I think she can. Um, I mean, obviously, you don't know what's around the corner as far mm -hmm. as, uh, you know, if Andreva, mm -hmm. for example, just becomes like a great clay court player. But, you know, who else looks as comfortable on clay, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's a little older than Iga, the same age, or a little bit younger? Nobody. So I do think... Um, <laughs> You know, Iga can certainly chase down Chrissy's record already with three. It's hard to believe it's two years ago this week that Iga played that crazy Roland Garros in the middle of October because yeah. of the pandemic, and that's what started to up her tally. Um, so, yeah, I think anything's possible. Three banked by 22 yep. is crazy. And shout out to Andreva, a 16-year-old into the top 50. I was looking at the names of, of people that had done that. It's like Capriati, Serena, Hingis, Coco. It's a pretty good company. Yeah, and, and this uh, at this time to do it, it was much easier back in the day. It wasn't the age eligibility rule. There wasn't as big a tennis physical. Yeah, that's a big thing. that The age eligibility rule, like 
and just to explain to everyone out there, they lim- they limit your events now that you can play, right? Like that was the thing. Back then it was just free-for-all, turn yeah. pro and play. And there were too many patterns of young players, uh, say, who started in the mid-teens, 15 to mm-hmm. 17 years of age, who struggled, whether it was physical or emotional, uh, a combination of really talented young players early in their career, whether it was Jaeger, Austin, again, for very different reasons, mm-hmm. They were sidetracked, and they never really got back on track. And in the end, a lot of people felt it was because they played too much. Well, we've seen some of these teens not just get limited. They've actually gone above and beyond after they have this ranking breakthrough. Coco, obviously, is the great example. A good first outing, returning to the court after, you know, we mentioned after winning the U.S. Open, the life-changing moment, we mentioned that Iga was going to adjust. But what have you seen? Obviously, she wins the major, works with Brad Gilbert, and works tirelessly on her game. But in the last year or so, since the last time we talked, what developments have you seen? How has she honed her skills the most and become a major champion? Well, if you'd asked me that right after Wimbledon, I would have had a totally different answer. Um, the response that Coco and the team has had since Wimbledon by adding, you know, where I know Pear Rebo was hired a little bit mm-hmm. before Brad Gilbert, but to, to, to be able to merge those voices together, um, to have the presence of the dad to be able to step back from at least being in the box. I mean, obviously, he's still very much involved. I thought it was a really mature decision by Coco and the team to bring on who they brought on. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to me, it was a clear, it was almost like in a m- much less high profile way, a little bit what I went through with Donna, which is bring a clear voice, help get rid of some of the noise that develops in your head. Um, certainly, there hadn't been a shot that was as criticized as much as the Coco Golf forehand um, all year long through Wimbledon, and then for her to be able to figure out how to emotionally put this shot in the right place. Like the forehand's not a total disaster as long as her footwork's okay and she has the right racket head speed, Mm -hmm. but she needed to change her mindset. I felt like she got caught up in all the Mm -hmm. questions about it. Instead of worrying about what makes her great on the court, which is her speed, her serve, and her emotional toughness. Yeah, and she showed all those in the U.S. Open run in the final. Focusing on strengths, which is what Gilbert and Reva brought to the team, also, and I, I say this from the outside, but one person wins a week. How you handle the losses and how you handle the progress is huge because you can't, you can't even ego like winning all those matches. You're going to lose in this sport. So how you handle the week to week ups and downs and, and ride that wave. And she's shown tremendous maturity at her age. So I'm I'm excited to see where it goes because we're at the spot with women's tennis where I mean the final field. These are this is as adequately loaded a final field as we've had in a long time. Top 10, all but Pagula made a major final. This is a pretty deep field. Yeah, it's exciting. Um, when you think about, like, Muhova, what she was able to do, almost winning Roland Garros <laughs> over Iga. Mm-hmm. Um, to see Vondrasova come through when Wimbledon. It, it, you know, to me, it's the best of both worlds. You have some players like Sabalenka, R- Rybakina, obviously Iga, Coco, Pagula, really defending their top 10 ranking, or in the case of most of those I mentioned, top five. Um, But also you have some newcomers and you have some opportunities. So I think it's a really good balance right now. Yeah, we did talk. I think it was the first time where you're like, I'd like to see some, you know, more consistency at the top. And I think we're getting it. I mean, I think we're, it's not, it's hard to get to your era where it was just the same dominant Hall of Fame women. And maybe when you were playing, it would have been nice to have a couple less, but, (laughs) but it is nice now that we're not seeing as many, I don't want to say flukes, but as many one and done runs. And then back to the mean. Well, also, I'm kind of, um, I'm sort of eager to look at the last five years who had breakthroughs, who kind of disappeared for a bit for whatever reason, physical or just things Mm that their life was kind of turned upside down by the success. And let's see if Andrescu can remain healthy for a period of time, make a push back towards the top 10. You know, how will Radha Kanu come back after the surgeries? Will, Will she be able to continue her promise um, and maybe Radicano will have a chance to reset and have more of yeah. a normal trajectory towards the top. Yeah, you were on that as well. Like it's and it's, Osaka. Sorry, and I mean Osaka. And, and come in, we got some great maternity leaves continuing. <laughs> yeah, the sport just keep the train just keeps rolling like it doesn't stop. Remember, it wasn't that long ago that match in Asia, uh, Osaka and Andrescu. It was like a three hour classic, and you know, unfortunately for you know, fortunately or unfortunately, things are going to happen, but. Do you, do you have, before we move on, do you have a favorite kind of matchup stylistically? I know you're just a tennis nerd like me. There's some good rivalries brewing and styles, and I just want to know if a women's rivalry is sticking out to you. Well, I think there's a few that are starting to come to the top. Um, 
First off, I'll just say as far as styles, like, uh, like I never would have thought I would have enjoyed two players bashing the ball <laughs> as hard as each other as Rybakina and Sabalenka. Uh, that ran down. Open. Final. It's, I mean, that was just unbelievable. It reminded yeah. me a little bit of a 30 year ago <laughs> match when um, Capriati took on Celis in the semifinals yep. of the U.S. Open, and it was seven six in the third to Celis. But it was like this knockdown, <laughs> drag out power clash that wasn't full of unforced yeah. errors, and that's kind of what happened. So that was great <laughs> to see. But generally, matches that I like the most are contrasting style matches where you can sort of see a lot more of the chess moves. Yeah, Iga Sabalenka or, you know, Coco Sabalenka in that regard. I, it was crazy. I had that, like, Sabalenka or Vaca, you wouldn't think that'd be, you know, the style that works, but it does. Maybe it's the contrasting emotions, like the sound of metal in Sabalenka and the sound of silence. Rabakina just doesn't react. It's the craziest thing I've seen. You know, I hadn't really thought about that. <laughs> yeah. it's not only do you have contrasting mm -hmm. styles, game style, but you mm -hmm. also have contrasting mm -hmm. styles with emotions. Yeah. So th that was on... Um, you there for yeah. Rybakina and Sabalenka. There's some good ones for sure. Uh, and then your, your thoughts on Cancun as a, as a spot. I know a lot happened and they had to kind of scramble, but, you know, it is something. I mean, I would like to, like, we're all hoping that there's more planning in the future, but thoughts on the finals being in Cancun this year? Well, first off, big respects to the family in Mexico. I, I know their first names, Gus, Gus Jr. and Gus Sr., the father-son combination that lead their family's uh, investment in women's tennis. When you think about two years ago, Guadalajara hosted the WTA Tour Final. It's kind of the last we ended up seeing of Muguruza as she won it, and I haven't hardly seen her since. But it was an amazing atmosphere, and they have a similar situation in Cancun, and I saw the start of the build of the stadium in the last week. It is really not enough time to promote such a mm -hmm. big event. And, and I do think women's tennis, the culmination tour championships, deserves to have a better and longer spotlight. But having said that, we're still just emerging out of the most difficult time because of the pandemic and because of geopolitics. Um, and so I kind of understand how it came to be that it was late again, but it's like enough already. Let's have enough mm -hmm. of a advance warning and really promote yeah. it because this deserves to be highlighted. Yeah. The players are all invested. You know, they're going to be there. They want to play for the ranking points, the money, everything, and the, and the bragging rights. So hopefully we get to a point where it's more heavily promoted and, uh, it seems like it's going to get in that direction. And also Pagua and Coco doing it in doubles too. You can kind of speak to how hard that is, right? Like to be a top player in both the singles and the doubles tour when it could, you know, there could be that push pull. If your singles aren't doing as well, am I in the back of your mind thinking, am I focusing a little more on doubles than I should? Yeah. I only lived through that as far as late, late in both tournaments once. And that was in 88 when I got the singles final, losing mm -hmm. to Sabatini and Martina and I won the doubles. I saw Martina go through it every <laughs> year for like 15 years. Yeah. Um, and it's, I think it's one of the great things that the, two out of three set format in the women's game really allows for players like Goff and Pagula to push towards the top in both singles and doubles. I like it. More with Pam Shriver here on Tennis Channel Inside In. Just a beautiful time in the tennis calendar. We're into October. There's still matches on the other side of the world from us here in Santa Monica, California. Reacting to one that we just saw, you know, that we just, just happened last night, Ben Shelton took out Yannick Sinner in a three set intense highly entertaining matchup we'll get to center in a second but ben shelton again i mean he's professing it pam he is built for these big stages and big moments and he brings something to tennis that i think was maybe missing a little bit and it's so refreshing to see another dynamic personality who is backing it up against the best and, and it's a combination of uh the young fresh face <laughs> and the bold personality um you know, he was part of one of the more controversial moments, a couple of them at the U.S. Open, when he hung up, when he answered the phone, answered the call against <laughs> yeah. Tiafo, and then, and then Djokovic kind of turned the tables and did the same thing. And but it was, it's kind of like cool for tennis to be like yeah. in the trash talking elite <laughs> yeah. of, of athletes. Why not? Why not tennis? And you know, I think, um, yeah, Ben Shelton along with Alcaraz, Coco Goff. I mean, they they lead the charge of this 19, 20, 21 year old age group that's pretty special. He's an exceptional athlete as far as tennis players goes. Watching the match, his movement, his ability, the power he generates. Everyone knows about the serve. What I saw today was if he can just hang in the rally just enough, the backhand was much maligned. If he can give himself more looks, because he puts so much pressure on you with that serve, yeah. it's. From the lefty side, you know, like what he can do with it. He is, you know, and he's raising his level. That's the other thing. I think the question with him was that tour record when he was still a rookie, having his dad in his corner, Brian Shelton, is a huge influence. But 
he is raising his level when he gets out there. We know Sinner was a little tired, but you know, Shelton, <laughs> Shelton went and took that match. He lost four straight points in that third set tiebreaker and still won. Yeah, and you know, you kind of think about Shelton's last ten months, say, and he had the breakthrough down in Australia, getting to the quarters, and then really struggled <laughs> to win matches. Didn't win back to back mm-hmm. matches till the summer. Um, but stayed still so positive. And speaking of doubles, he got to the doubles final in D.C. Uh, I think he lost that doubles final, but I noticed, I was like thinking to myself when he won those matches to get through to the doubles final, sometimes how doubles wins can help set the table for singles. And mm. it was soon thereafter that he really turned it yeah. back on in the singles, and we saw what he did at the U.S. Open. Um, and I think now um, Shelton's going to be ready to keep marching along, assuming he stays healthy, which is always the million-dollar question. Absolutely no worries about Yannick, what he's done. I mentioned you, know, you win in China. He beat Medvedev to do it, which he goes Alcaraz Medvedev and throwing up in a trash can, might oh I add. Oh, my God. <laughs> but maybe that's a good Ugh. luck charm now. But, look, he's number four in the world. He's working with another one of your friends, Darren Cahill. He's made a difference there. Sinner has proven that he could be next up. Now, I don't know what the gap is in the majors. Djokovic, obviously, has still got the stranglehold. Alcaraz has proven he's on that level. But I think relatively across the board, tennis people think Sinner could be the next one. When you think about one of the more interesting off-court marketing things, it was the Wimbledon poster, right? The rivalry poster that had Alcaraz and Sinner walking down the steps first. People didn't and, like that. No, a lot of people didn't, but maybe Wimbledon knew something. And and certainly given their how close they are in, in ages. And, and their main contrast is a little bit of their game, but it's really that personality uh, mm-hmm. difference that, that makes it fun. So, again, men's tennis, women's tennis, a lot of great young stars and um, sinners l- learning. It's not easy to win a tournament as bi- big as Beijing and then get mm-hmm. ready again the very next mm-hmm. week. And it makes you realize how tremendous the big three were yeah. to do that year after year. What do you think something that Cahill's made a difference on Sinner's game or maybe mental outlook to this long grind of a season? Yeah, well, Darren is definitely not only a great tactical, technical coach, but he's a great mindset coach. So I think um, that's been an improvement for Yannick Sinner to believe he belongs at the top. Uh, When I first talked to Darren uh, about 14 months ago, when he first started with Yannick, and I I asked him, I said, what are one of the things you're working on early? He said a couple things with a serve. Mm -hmm. Really felt that given his height, given his live arm, that he could get more out of the serve. Mm-hmm. You know, and obviously, the more free points, and I've had this conversation with Donna a ton, is the more you can hit your targets on your serve, win short points, especially mm-hmm. you know, as your career develops, mm-hmm. it's just easier. So the serve, to me, will always be the most important shot in tennis, and I feel like that's where Darren's made one of the biggest differences. Makes sense, and you can just look at a guy like Novak Djokovic, who serve MPHs isn't as high, but it's gotten better. He's worked it, and he is so money in big points, hitting the target, getting a free point. And look at his second serve, how much that shot's improved in the last 15 years. Yeah. I mean, really, for Djokovic, it's like shoring up the forehand from early in his career, his mental game, and then that second serve, and you you improve those three yeah. areas as much as he has, no wonder. You just have to evolve. I think that's what it comes down to. The game is constantly improving, getting better, and you're not getting any younger. Djokovic like a chameleon out there. We saw it in Serena. We saw it in Federer at the end of his career, too. So yeah. something to consider. I mean, listen, capturing longevity right now, given the physical nature and the demands on the arm and the hips and the feet and the ankles, mm-hmm. you know, the way pl- athletes move. I mean, you see the way... Uh, players move these days and if you turn back the channel like 30 years you almost feel like it's a different sport in some ways <laughs> yeah that was uh, a couple weeks ago uh, Mark Petchy came on the show got a, caused a little bit of an uproar with the take that he thinks Coco Goff is the best pure athlete he's seen in women's tennis and he, his whole argument was the game's evolving with how they're moving nowadays not to take away of like tennis players and what you accomplish also with the caveat of, like, it's hard to compare eras, so. Yeah, it's hard to you know compare, what I mean? compare eras of great athletes, <laughs> yeah. like like put Groff up and, and he, Navratilova yeah. and um, yeah. any number of, I, I would even say, I always like to look at <laughs> smaller athletes, too, like Justine Enna, Ash yeah. Barty, Billie Jean King, the ones that are 5'6 or mm-hmm. shorter. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's interesting, and it's a, it is tough to compare. This Shanghai Masters event, which is longer, it, we're seeing some upsets, you know, the full field wasn't there. But certain players, like Korda beats Medvedev, gets Shelton next. Sevi Korda with two wins over Medvedev had a dip in the middle of the year, but suddenly an opportunity for him. Rublev had that match yesterday uh, as we record this against Manorino where he apologized for playing so well. 
<laughs> six three six love. He's like, sorry, I was unreal. So like, there is a zone. You would know this. Like, there's moments when you're in the zone where it's like, wow, this is. Put this on my calendar of days. I feel yeah. untouchable. It's fascinating. <laughs> uh, the Corda Shelton matchup. They never played. They're both about the. You know, Corda's a couple of years older. Corda is somebody who you know. Another one. They also mm-hmm. both got to the quarters of the Australian Open, first major of the year. They both suffered issues after that. Corda's was more physical with a wrist injury. Um, but obviously, and, and talk about somebody I noticed, like his serve, Corda's serve seemed to be a little more powerful and earning him more free points. So I, I love the matchup and how they're pushing each other, especially yeah. the American guys. Yeah, we've seen, I mean, even in this tournament, like Hubie Herkush wins. So he's, I saw a stat like eight out of nine Masters finals he's made the quarters of. So he's gone deep in all these events. Uh, Merez and the guy who the kid who beat Alcaraz, he wins again. He beats Rude last night. And this is somebody, and I bring him up, with this expanded field, there's going to be the arguments of is it good, is it bad. He's not in the draw. He might not eat. I mean, most likely it would be tough for him to get out of qualifying, but a bigger field and opportunity, and here he is setting his Europe. And it just shows you the depth in the game. Um, when you see, you know, players ranked, you know, around the 100 mark or even lower, have their chance. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they they go into it. Maybe they've had you know, some futures or challenger tournaments that have they've been through the semis and the finals. They've played sometimes you can play more matches at the lower level and then you're you get your break in a main mm-hmm. a, big ATP tournament like Shanghai and you can really yeah. pay it off. Whereas you get some right. players that are ranked around twenty because they're playing high level <laughs> tournaments. They've only played a couple matches in the last two months. Yeah. I mean this tournament still does have Alcaraz, so I'm like not <laughs> fully saying we're gonna see complete parody. Uh his match with Evans was exceptional and I wanted your reaction to the thoughts. He's like, I think about Djokovic every day, every practice, getting number one and beating the best. Well, I think that's part of building a rivalry, right? I mean, it's really been special what's happened since Roland Garros um, because that was the semifinal that everybody wanted. They hadn't, you know, they I guess they'd played in Madrid the year before, yeah. but they hadn't played at a major. Um, and then even though it didn't end up great because of the loss of condition by Alcaraz, first two sets were just mind-blowingly great and then the Wimbledon final the same so whenever you can get two great matchups late in a major that are that memorable a rivalry is born and I love the fact that Alcaraz just says out front I think (laughs) about him every day I don't know if he thinks about the number 23 because that would be a little intimidating yeah we have to (laughs) that's true that's a lot of majors and that's why I say if Alcaraz finishes with like 12 majors or Pete Sampras is 14 let's not overlook how insane that is to win that many majors so but he's got the goods for sure and, and the last thing on the men's match is that i wanted to get to you know you go and bear beats it's a pass and bear has a stat that's like nine and nine versus the top 10 for a guy who's never been in the top 20 and he's got a worse winning percentage against uh, yeah lefty and against the non-top 20 yeah i just wanted to make sure i was 100 yeah. percent that uh lefty because i do think these the lefties yeah. on both the men's and the women's tour yeah. have this innate kind of benefit of you don't see as many lefties and you can just surprise him. Look what Manorino's done this year. He's had one of the best years of his career in his mid thirties and, and Shelton on the younger side with his yeah. leftiness. So I, it, it's the, great. The Manorino Shelton, that's like the spectrum of like power in tennis, right? That's like w- both ends of the spectrum. Did you ever play anyone like Manorino that like gave you nothing power wise? Well, actually from the back of the court, I was a little bit known that way where I would just kind of like slice and dice and push it back and then wait for the short ball and then come in. But no, I think uh Manorino combination, the lefty and the lack of power, what does he string his racket at? Like a, <laughs> like a fishing net. Yeah. Um, it's an unusual package. Yeah. He also says he doesn't know who he's playing until oh, right crazy. before, right? Is like, I know tennis players, you guys can be like all athletes, maybe a little quirky at certain things. Not looking at draws, I kind of understand. But to not know, I mean, in this age of scouting, I was like, wow. It's funny, this week, uh, (laughs) Donna and I spoke a couple days before the start of Zhenzhou, which is on this week. I think that's how you say the name of the city. And and she told me she was going to play a certain player, and then I looked the next day to find out when she played, and it was like totally different. Turns out too late with draws. Uh, But she doesn't like to know anything other than her next opponent. And, And like during the U.S. Open this year, didn't want to know who she played that when the draw came out 
because it's like gives you four or five days. Right. And sometimes that's just too much time to think about one right. opponent. I think it's fair to have a day. <laughs> I mean, that, yeah, to literally day. just show up at the court and be like, oh, I'm playing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. obviously you're in this day and age, every, yeah. pretty much everybody has a team. So your team is in charge of mm -hmm. the scouting. And then mm -hmm. a lot of people don't want to know the game plan days and days in advance. Okay. You want to talk about yeah. it the day before. Well, the last thing too with this, where should we be concerned wise with Sitsipas? Because it's there's you know, it's been an interesting year to say the least. There's been a lot of turbulence. I'll I'll put it. Yeah, a lot of turbulence, a lot of on and off court uh, social media posts, a lot of stuff about the coaching situation, dating Badosa. You know, I I know what it's like to be the chaser and to not quite get there. Mm -hmm. um, it was exhausting. When I, I, I had about eight or nine years where I was somewhere between three and seven in the world and trying to chase down Chrissy, Martina, and then Groff and Sellis and eventually hit the wall uh, around when I was like 27, 28. Mm -hmm. um, so whether or not that's happening to Sitsipas now and kind of like a little disheartened now seeing the quality of Alcaraz, Sinner, and, and even Shelton. Maybe get past as like a thing that For creeps. Sure. And he had that two sets to love on Djokovic in the French Open final. To not have a major means Vera of dealing with similar things up in that match against team, but it weighs on you. I would just say, and I don't even judge the the personal life stuff. More power to him. Let everyone be happy. Stability in the coaching ranks does matter. You you can't convince me otherwise. Look at these players that are having su success. I think he. I, I hope whatever he decides, it's his life. He's a grown man. It's his career that he does get to a place where there's stability. Well, it's interesting when you look at. Uh, I'll throw in. Sonia Kennan and her dad, and even Coco Goff and her dad and Sitsipas, is it's a combination of when you get a young adult, um, and I'm going through this now with my teenagers that are 18, 18, and 19, you want them to strive towards independence from their parents. You want them to be, you know, supportive of your family, uh, mm -hmm. but yet have their own path. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's up to both. It's yeah. up to the it's up to the maturing adult in this case the young player, but it's also really up to the parent to give the green light right. that it's okay yeah. to, for the parent to take a step back. That's why I highlighted what yeah. Corey Goff has done right. to help Coco. Well, I just didn't like how the the Phil Pusis thing was handled. It didn't seem right to me that he just says in a press conference like we're we're kind of ending our relationship now. But you know, that's a, that's a tough well, we've one. We've heard that before, right? They've had yeah. like this in, yeah. out, in yeah. out. So I, I, I yeah. don't know. But I, I think if I was Philip Pousses, I would not. If I was asked to go back a third time, I would have to say <laughs> N-O. Coaching movement's tough. I, I want to say that with giving a shout out to Quinn Wen Zhang for, uh, you know, writing the ship after some stuff that went down for her. It's just, it's tough. And I know the coaches we talked about last week have a right to move on because it is a cutthroat business. But just hope for some professionalism in uh, how business is handled. Yeah. I mean, in that case, Wim Facet obviously was coaching Osaka and before Osaka took the break. And, um, you know, these are, <laughs> these are tough, these are tough yeah. things and I don't know the ins yeah. and outs, but I can certainly understand professionally why Wim would want to try and step mm -hmm. up to the challenge of getting Osaka back on track. For sure. Yeah, for sure. Hope these players can uh, bounce back and play their best tennis going forward. Uh, wrapping up here with Pam Shriver on Tennis Channel Inside and a couple quick hitters before I let you go. We're both happy as relative East to Midwest or Westerners at heart that Cincinnati's staying, re up for it looks like another 25 years or beyond. Djokovic and Coco Golf make the announcement, but the Charlotte, uh, you know, luring was there, but the Cincinnati Masters staying at home. In such a professional team in charge of uh, the series of tournaments that Ben Navarro is invested in and you know, whether or not it was a ploy to try and get a better deal in Cincinnati and maybe they weren't going anywhere mm -hmm. anyway, but I do think the rise up of support from the mm -hmm. players, from fans, from, you know, everybody in tennis who just has a special spot, even though Mason, Ohio doesn't provide the greatest five-star <laughs> hotels, oh. five-star restaurants, you got to yeah. go into Cincinnati. It's still such a beautiful fabric of the of the Midwest, and it's a really important tennis region for our country i like seeing the matches when king's island is just shooting off fireworks <laughs> just while tennis is going on but i had faith in todd martin running that now that he would you know midwest guy was going to keep it there so props to cincinnati for for keeping it going also want to give a shout out we, we mentioned it last week but 
another coworker of yours, Lindsay Davenport, going to take yes. over the Billie Jean King Cup team? I, th- I thought Kathy Rinaldi has done a great job. It was a great run by her, won the title in 2017. But something kind of feels you know perfect about Lindsay Davenport being the captain of this team. Well, Lindsay's really done it all in the sport. She's been number one and won an Olympic gold, played on all the then. It was called Fed Cup. Uh, is uh, part of the support team for, to, for one of the rising young mm-hmm. stars in the in boys' tennis with their son, Jagger. So Lindsay knows all parts of tennis, from what it takes to win a major, an Olympic gold, team events, you know, how to manage the season. I think she was in the coaching box when Madison Keys had her first great breakthrough in Melbourne, getting to the semifinals. And people have a lot of respect. And when, whenever I listen to Lindsay on Tennis Channel, such great quality, such an incredible tennis IQ. I'm not sure I realized when Lindsay played that she was so sound mm-hmm. with the tactics of how to play. And I think those little tidbits that you can do from the sideline uh, in the coaching box in the Billie Jean King Cup, I think Lindsay will make a difference. We did a uh, podcast last July before the Wimbledon final, and I've never talked to someone of her stature that just downplayed her own career so much. Oh. It was like halfway through my come on like always, always. <laughs> like, like, yeah and, and you know you look at her overall yeah. career title somewhere in the mid 40s and how many you know tier, yeah. what we would call the wta 1000s yeah could have won more than just three majors but at least she got those three in. she did and she beat some incredible players to do it so uh we do love to see that I, I wanted to get your opinion as a former player just a crash course if you will on the tennis ball issue mm-hmm. because i know there's been players on both tours now um you know, Paul Bedosa is saying it's an issue on the women's tour as well as the men's, but that there's a lot of shoulder injuries and, and wrist and elbow injuries because of how heavy these balls are. Is this something that, you know, with your pulse to the courts, working with the player being at these events that you're noticing as well? And is it something that we can fix? Well, I think we need to have a really expert panel, kind of like we had the age eligibility panel, because that, that <laughs> got to the heart of why there were so many sort of early burnouts. But if we're having arm injuries and one of the contributing factors is the change of tennis ball so many times during the course of a year. You know, you think about how golf, golfers can can play with their own golf balls and tennis, mm-hmm. you're at the at the you're beholden to the tournament and the deal they've done with what manufacturer. And maybe if you play Guadalajara, it's at altitude. Mm-hmm. And so that's a totally different kind of ball. And all in a time when the game is so powerful, they felt like they had to slow the courts down, put more grit on the hard courts. And how that responds to some tennis balls, some it fluffs up, some yep. it takes the fluff off. So I do think we need to look at it because the pace of play is enough to ruin arms, shoulders, mm. elbows. And so if we can do anything to help the athlete arm, I'm all for it. There is the, and again, this is a tennis player argument out there, that they want that the balls are slower, they want longer points, and that is a negative reaction to the health. If that is the case and there's something we can do to change that I'm all for it because you don't want players getting injured you don't the season and, and people will look at how long the season is as well so I mean we're into month 10 of this and we you know we have players dropping like flies it seems like it's something that can be at least adjusted a little bit yeah and look I know the sport has reacted to different phases of how the game was played when the men uh, were dominating in the 80s and early 90s with a lot of big serving. And like yeah. it was like serve plus one. There was very few rallies over four. Mm-hmm. Wimbledon slowed their grass courts down. So they played more like hard courts. The balls were probably adjusted. So I just think we need to not let the pendulum swing right. so far and say, mm-hmm. oh, because I want entertaining <laughs> long rallies that actually right. hurt the yeah. body and the wear and tear. So yeah. you got to split the difference. How different would you say? having your experiences that Wimbledon court is from when you played it. (laughs) Well, it's funny this year. I wouldn't call my, my, the way I hit this year exactly um, the way I used to play, but I did hit for about 15, 20 minutes on the grass courts and the bounces are definitely (laughs) higher, which for me at my age, I was happy not to have to bend down, but you know, they have homogenized a little bit so that grass courts definitely play more like a medium pace hard court. Well, I'm excited to see the rest of this year. Uh, last thing for Pam Shriver. is always generous with her time. Um, might be hitting the links later today. From I I've think heard, I am. So. I'm, I'm playing with the former Baltimore Oriole, Brady Anderson. who has oh, been a friend since Brady I Anderson. put on my charity tennis okay. event in Baltimore. He loved tennis. He Did, got to know yeah. some of the women players back in the day. And so we're going to tee it up. Didn't know he was out here. I 50 home runs in 96. Yeah. I remember that. You know, I, I will say... Brady was one of the first really sad moments for me as a as a Cleveland formerly Indians fan. 
that 96 season, they came in and beat us, and I just had to Sorry. witness that. So <laughs> I hope you guys get make it a series this time. The, the last thing, though, is when, what about Rafa coming back? What should we expect? I know I want to be reasonable. I don't want it to be the cliche farewell tour, but you know, should there be a little optimism or taper expectations? What should we expect when Nadal comes back? I think taper expectations. I, I feel like... You know the three out of this is where the three out of five set format. If if he wants to really have the ultimate goal, which is to add to his tally of majors, I just think it's really hard now with what his mm-hmm. body's been through. I do think the two out of three, whether it's the Olympic Games, there's certain things he could mm-hmm. maybe try to manage and and be respectable. But I, I'm having a hard time seeing how this is going to go down. And it's that game evolving. There's always a new crop of young strapping men entering the workforce and just coming in and you know we saw that with Federer I mean we, we, the last time we talked it was okay he saw the writing on the wall you joked about it like that center Alcaraz match happened it was probably like okay might be time to exit stage right yeah and, and when you think about all the work that Rafa has put into his game the reps and that top spin and the way he his physicality and he's had to make some adjustments mm-hmm. and cut down on the hours of training to try and have mm-hmm. a long career, which he has had, but now it's a certain point. Where else do you turn? Yeah. Well, we'll just cherish any time we get with 100%. him. Uh, Pam Shriver, always a blast. Thanks again for taking time out of your day to come on the podcast. I know you got your friends with the A-listers. We're trying to always chase that outstanding show. So anytime I get to talk tennis with you is a blast and a privilege. So thanks again for coming on Inside In. Looking forward to the next time. 